Hi there, welcome to this video which I'm going to show you how to use a live PA system and a recording system to accompany your SOND3 tutorial workbook. Uh, those of you that are doing level 1 and level 2 music at school and you might be working through SOND1 and SOND2 unit standards, uh, you'll find this is useful as well because I'll take you right back to the very beginning and show you how to use all parts of a live PA and recording system. But then as we get into the mixing side of it, we'll get into the more advanced concepts of uh, what, that are required for SOND3. Here we are in the St Andrews College Music Room, not an ideal environment for a live gig, I know, for a live concert. Um, but what we're going to be able to do in here is actually show you how to use a live uh, PA system for a rock band and also record them at the same time. We will then also go and do overdubs uh, for the band as well so that we can actually end up with a really good recording and also a good live sound mix. The SOND3 standard talks about you needing to uh, talk about different contexts, performance contexts, and it gives you a whole bunch of options of such as live PA or sound for music theatre for musicals, sound for plays, sound for live TV, recording studios, kapahakas, assemblies, etc. So we're going to focus on two of those today. We're going to focus firstly on the live sound and secondly also on recording. Now what we have in this room at the moment is our setup for our live sound system. What we have is our speakers over on each side of the room. We notice we've got a uh, speaker at the top and also the subs down below. We've got our drum kit in the middle here and we're going to be having a bass guitar going through an amplifier and also an electric guitarist who is also going to sing. Uh, you might see a few other microphones floating around in the middle of the room. Don't worry about those at this stage. They're going to be used for, um, in some cases, tuning the room and also just capturing the sound of this for, for the video, so not actually related to the setup. Uh, everything I'll, which we will be using, I will introduce as we go. First of all, before you set up for the live sound system, it's really helpful to draw yourself out a diagram of where things are going to go. I haven't done this in this case, but there's some key things I want to introduce to you and talk about that are very important. Firstly, is the position of our speakers. You will notice that the speakers are forward of where we have our performing area. I'm going to be standing up here in the performing area, and you'll see this is where the guitarist is going to be playing and where he's also going to be singing. He's a bit shorter than me, hence the height of this microphone stand. But what's very important about this is that the microphones, microphones on the drums, microphones that you're singing through, microphones for the guitar amp are all behind where the speakers are. The point of doing that is that that will reduce the chances of feedback. If you want to know what feedback is and you want to blow up your system, take a microphone and point it at the speakers. Uh, no, don't do that, unless it's your system and you don't mind losing it. Because what happens is it creates an infinite loop of sound and it's that big, piercing, really noisy, horrible sound that will blow your ears and also blow your speakers if you're not careful. So that's the first thing. Make sure you position everything for the best sound. It's going to make it easiest to mix, trying to avoid feedback. The second thing which is very important about the placement is that I have not got the speakers close to walls and away from corners. Now, as we're going to talk about later on as we start tuning the room, you'll see that um, different rooms resonate at different frequencies. And putting subs and speakers right up against the wall will heavily reinforce low frequency in the room, which is what you don't want to have. You want to be able to control the sound, and you want to be able to control how much uh, low, mids, and high frequencies you have. So the speakers are away from walls, away from corners. Um, and then the next important thing is actually the placement of our mixer. If we just look around and look at where I've got my mixer here, now once again I repeat this is not an ideal situation because our room is just too small, but in a normal performance venue such as a school assembly, a school hall or an outdoor gig, we would have our mixing position in the middle of where the speakers are and also around about maybe half, two thirds, three quarters of the way back in the venue. For the same reason you want to avoid walls and corners for the speakers, you want to avoid your mixing position. We want to have our mixing desk away from walls, away from corners, so that we don't get the extra reverberation that walls and speakers can do. You want to get out of the corners, get out of the overhangs, get out from underneath balconies, and get in the best possible position. Uh, it's also very important that you do that so that you can, do, um, it gives you the best opportunity to create a good mix. Uh, if you are off in the corner, the likelihood is you are not going to create a good mix for your paying customers. It is much better to take away four or five prime seats and take away the revenue you'll get from selling those seats in an auditorium so that you can place your mixer in its ideal position, then it is to get the extra money from those four or five seats and have the whole mix for everybody who's there compromised by mixing from a corner. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over a look at setting up in the next section of this video. OK, now as we discussed before, we have our speakers in the optimal position. Now one thing that's very, very important about these speakers that I need to point out is that these are active speakers. Now there's two types of speakers, active and passive. Active means that we have an amplifier built into them. Passive speakers would have a separate amplifier, much like, say, a home, home hi-fi system. Uh, you'll find that in the past, pretty much all PA systems were passive speakers and had separate boxes of amplifiers. Uh, but more and more these days, the quality of active speakers are becoming very good, and for environments like schools, they become very convenient. Uh, in the past, at a school I was working at before, I had a system that had separate passive and amplifiers, passive speakers and amplifiers, and I think it took about four days for my students to blow them up through in correct usage. So this time when I bought some new system, new system here at this school, I decided to go for active speakers. So that means the amplifiers are perfectly suited to the speakers. Um, if you do have a separate sister, a system which has separate amplifiers and passive speakers, it's very important that you get help with it, setting up if you don't know what you're doing, and that you also read the instruction manuals to make sure that you uh, power everything and connect everything correctly. OK, now the other thing about all of our speaker systems, in fact, everything in our room and in our system, is that we have all the electricity coming from the same place. So what we've got for this system here, we have a power plug over in the side of the wall where we've got a whole bunch of extension cables coming out from that are going to all of our speakers, our mixing desk, our amplifiers on the stage, our guitar and bass guitar amplifiers, um, and any other pieces of equipment, electrical equipment that we have in our system. Now the reason for this is that if you have electricity coming from separate circuits in your room, that can create a hum in your system, and you really don't want that. So to avoid that, first of all, plug everything that uses electricity in your system, including guitar amplifiers if they're connected up via a DI box, as we'll discuss later. Make sure it all comes from the same spot. Do not assume that all the power plugs in your room are going to be on the same circuit. Often they're not, so it's good to make sure all the power comes from one place. If you have a very large system, you will then want to check that you're not going to overload the circuits in that. And so you want to maybe check with your school technicians uh, to figure out that that is OK. OK, so now we come to plugging in. First of all, what we have is that we've got, we're going to plug in our sub and also our big speakers. Now our sub particularly here uses this kind of connector. And this is what you're going to find on most speaker ca um, cables now. Cables which connect up amplifiers to passive um, speakers will use these, they're called Neutric or Speak On twist lock connectors. Now this one, as we plug it in, is actually the power cable. So I'm going to pop this into our sub, turn that on first of all. And I'll also say at this stage that I've actually already gone and turned my mixing desk on. A good rule is that the mixing desk is first on and last off. If we turned on all our amplifiers and speaker systems um, and then turned on that mixing desk afterwards, we might get a big, loud, clunking, horrible sound through the system, which is dangerous for the speakers. So we make sure the mixing desk is turned on first of all. The next thing is that this is my cable here, which is coming from my main out on my mixing desk, which I'm going to plug in, in this case, to my sub. I'm going to plug it into my balanced input. Now that is not a speaker cable, this is a regular microphone cable. That's because I do not need proper speaker cables which can ha uh, handle high current or high loading, lots of electricity, because we're just sending a small signal from the mixing desk to the speaker, which is going into the, remember, the amplifier first inside the speaker box, then to the speaker. Now in this situation here, because I have a separate sub and a separate speaker, I'm then going to link the sub to the speaker. Now the speaker inside it has a thing called a crossover, and what the crossover does is it splits the signal up. And for our speaker here, we can actually set our crossover to be either at 90 hertz or 120 hertz. I'll discuss what hertz mean in a moment, but those are actually just mean really low sounds or moderately low sounds. So this way we're assigning different parts of the frequency spectrum to the different speakers. The sub will handle all the very low frequencies, and then the speakers up top will handle everything else. This takes a big load, off the top speakers and makes everything perform better. Plug it into my input. Now don't get too worried about the back of my speaker here. This is a special type of active speaker which has got a few more options. All you really need to have is an input. You, uh, if you've got something like this, which is a little mixing uh, console on the back of your speaker, then please consult your manual about how to use it and how to plug it in correctly. OK, so in this we've also already plugged in the power for the speaker. We've got power going in, we've got our cable from the mixing disc plugged into our sub, which we're then coming from the output of the sub to the input of our speaker. Now we can turn everything on. Now if you follow me this way, this cable we've got happening down here, and just see it on the floor here, the speaker cable, 
is coming up and is joining up with other audio cables that we've got. Now I've gone and used gaffer tape, every sound engineer's best friend is gaffer tape, to keep everything nice and tidy so that we're not going to trip over. The white cable next to it is our power cable. So you may be wondering why have I got my power cable set up separately when it would be neater and tidier to have it going along with all the other cables? Well that's because you don't want power cables going along the same, um, or running along right next to audio cables, because that will create sound or hum or interference in your system. So I've set up the power cable for our mixing desk area running along separately. And you'll see down here, where I have um, got the, sp the power cable and the audio cables crossing over, I've got it at a 90 degree angle, so that it will minimise any potential interference from the power cable onto the audio cables. So anyway, what we've got going on is we've got our speaker cables running into here, which is actually our main outs on the back of my mixing desk. You'll see there's a whole lot of other things plugged in, and I'll go through those in a moment. First of all, what we have here is our um, inputs into the mixing desk, and this is coming from our stage box, or snake. Now this, you'll see, has got channel 1, 2, 3, 4, through to 16, and this is actually the big thick cable that we saw running along the floor. So let's follow and see where this is going. If we come back this way, we'll follow along the floor, and you'll see it's coming up to this thing, this little patch bay. This is known as a stage box, or a snake, and it's got 16 inputs and 4 returns. We'll discuss returns in a moment. But first of all, the inputs are for all the microphones or DI boxes or anything which is creating sound in your audio system. Now, in a room this size, it was very easy for us just to put the microphones on the stage and run all of their cables down to the desk. It's a bit messy though, because we'll end up having 16 cables running down there. What this does, this makes it neater and easier. We can plug in 16 microphones here using short microphone cables, and it all goes down in one nice, big, thick cable, which keeps it nice and tidy. In a big environment, such as in a big hall or an outdoor venue, this becomes essential because you don't want to have to get 16 super long microphone cables to reach the desk. Instead, you can have um, one small microphone cable or 16 small microphone cables and then run them all through um, our 100 foot cable. Now, obviously, we're not using all 100 feet, we're using about 15 at the most. Now, I mentioned one thing before um, these returns. What are the returns for? Well, the two returns is what they, is, as the name describes, is returning the signal. So if these 16 microphone inputs are sending signal to the sound desk, the returns are returning up to four signals from the sound desk. The reason we use that is for foldback speakers. Now, let's quickly go back and look down the other end first of all. On our mixing console, we had our 16 inputs up here, but on this particular one we also have six outputs down here of which I've got four plugged in. Now this first one here, if we can see it, it says number one next to it. This is from what's called an auxiliary send. And we'll discuss what that means in a little bit. But let's just keep in mind that this is going to be sending sound through four of the channels, back through the snake box, through the snake to the stage box, and then out of our return. And this is really what we want to do this for, is so that we can take our return signals and plug them into these guys down here who we haven't discussed yet, our foldback speakers. They are foldback speakers because they are returning audio. Now the clever thing about mixing consoles, or all mixing consoles, whether they're digital or analogue, is that you will have auxiliary sends. You can create separate mixes for each musician that are different to the mix that you are creating for your audience through the front of house speakers. So that's because the guitarist doesn't necessarily want to hear everything that you're putting out front, they might usually want to hear just more of themselves, because that's the way guitarists are. No offence. It's a fact, I think. But what we can also get is that a singer could also say, well, I don't want so much guitar because I'm getting enough of it from the amplifier on stage. So the singer might want, I want more of myself, or I want more of the bass guitar. So you are able to create separate auxiliary mixes for each musician on stage. So we've got our return. Now what we're using here is just a standard old mic cable. This is an XLR connector, female XLR connector, going through to our male XLR connector, where we're going into this. Now you may have noticed there's another cable already plugged in. This is our power cable. Yes, just like our front of house speakers, these are active speakers. They are powered, so we don't need separate monitors for them. No, separate amplifiers, excuse me. While we're here, let's go and plug the other one in. So we're going to have return two. It's going to go into our return two send. And this also is going to come over to another speaker, which we can plug in. 
and turn on. Now, so far you've seen that we're going to have three musicians in a moment, but we've only got two speakers. Well, in the room this size, that would actually be fine. They would only need to go off two speakers. But I've got something else which is a rather clever set up here. Now, we've got the option of having more foldback speakers in our system. In a room this size, we probably don't need them because the drum is close enough to all the other speakers to hear pretty much everything. They don't need their own separate mix. But just because I'd like to show you something else which is rather clever, we're going to set up a headphone mix. So the drummer's going to be on headphones, and they're going to be able to have their own mix separate to the front of house, uh, or separate to the foldback mixes for the other um, musicians. Now what we're going to use for this is that we're going to go from the output of our return. Now you notice I'm using the jack output. And that's what this thing's here called. This is a jack unbalanced TS, otherwise a guitar cable. Now we can use either on this particular stage box, we can use e either use that as the output for the return or this. I'm going to use this one for a particular reason, because on the other end of where I'm going, I need to have a jack input, not an XLR. Now if I bring this round too, here, well, we'll see I've got this thing here called a headphone amplifier. This is actually a six channel headphone amplifier. We're not using any of that, we're just using the stuff down this end because we're using one channel. We can't plug headphones straight into the stage box. Even though it looks like it's the right kind of connection, the headphones wouldn't actually have enough current or enough signal or the correct impedance. So this is what a headphone amplifier is going to do for us. So I'm going to take, remember, my signal from the guitar, uh, from my mixer, sorry, and plug it into my input on the back of my headphone amplifier. Flick it on, and we can plug our headphones in here. Now, even though there's lots of knobs on here, the, the drummer does not have the ability to create their own mix of, say, more kick drum or more guitar or less bass and things like that. This is purely for uh, headphones, volume control or level control. What we're going to do, though, is that we will be able to do the mix for them using the auxiliary sends on the mixing desk. So the drummer will have headphones instead of a fallback speaker for their fallback. Now, the other good thing about this is that we're going to be able to use this for recording later on, for doing our overdubs. We're going to be able to send all our signal back through the return from the desk, through the auxiliary send, into the headphone amplifier, and whatever music musicians are recording at the time, they can use the headphones. Now, if this is not long enough for the other musicians, of course we can just move this, or we can use a big old extension cable. You'll see we've got a female jack input going to a male jack, in this case output, and this is what we'll be able to use for our headphones uh, if we need to spread them around the room. The other thing about um, what's happening more and more these days is that you're going to find in a lot of concert situations there is much less use of fallback monitors. Why? Well, because fallback monitors generally are loud. Uh, the musicians on stage, if they're playing rock in particular, like to have a big loud volume. They like to feel the, the weight of the sound moving. They like to keep it nice and loud. The problem for you as the front of house mixer is that for you to get a good mix out front, you have to get your front of house speakers and amplifiers way over the top of all the spillage that's coming from the fallback speakers on stage. In the end, that may not be possible. It may make it too loud for your audience and it might be hurting their ears. So if you go and turn down the fallback speakers and turn up your front of house, you'll find that musicians won't be happy either. Um, generally, they will not be happy that they're playing quieter, and they want to be louder because it feels better, and they think they can deliver a better performance. The way around this, we can get rid of our fallback speakers altogether and have the musicians all using headphones. What you're going to find most of the time, though, is that they're using in-ear headphones. Generally, quite expensive sorts of headphones which are moulded to the shape of people's ear individually and have to be done by an audiologist. Um, and you're going to find you can't get those for less than $1,000. Very expensive, but actually really worth it if you're working in a professional environment. Um, for now, though, we're going to use just some good old over-the-ear headphones. OK, let's have a look at what we're going to do with plugging in our microphones and then sound checking. So now it's time to start connecting our microphones. Before I start though, I want to introduce you to some different types of microphones that you need to know about for all of Sond 1, 2 and 3. Uh, the most common types of microphones you're going to come across are dynamic and condenser microphones. First of all, we have over here a couple of dynamic microphones. Now, if you've read your Sond books um, and you've done a bit of study already, you'll know that dynamic microphones are very, very good for live situations such as what we are working in initially. Reason why? You can drop them and they'll boy, be, they won't break. But don't test it unless the microphone's your own. Uh, but they're very, very sturdy. They're very rugged. They're going to be able to get through a, the rigours of a live touring gig band 
very, very well. And these ones, like the Shaw SM57 and the Shaw SM58, are actually very, very good quality, and you can pick them up for under $200. Now, you're going to find any professional concert in the world will probably most likely be using one other of these um, microphones. And even in a lot of recording studios, you'll still find this microphone in particular, Shaw SM57, very, very popular for micing snare drums, uh, guitar amps, toms, anything which is quite loud often choice over perhaps some more expensive uh, microphones. This actually works very, very well. Now we have another one from the same company, sure, but it looks a bit like it. But this is actually a condenser microphone. Condenser microphones are more sensitive. They are better for acoustic instruments such as violins, uh, cymbals, acoustic guitars, things which have a lot of high frequency content. It's not that the other microphones can't pick them up. This just picks it up better. It does sound nicer. Uh, now, condenser microphones require power often in the form of phantom power that will come from your mixing desk, 48 volt phantom power most likely. Um, however, you'll find that some microphones actually have places to put 9 volt batteries or AA batteries in them, and they can get their power that way. Now, we've got some other different types of condenser microphones that we can show you. We have here, these um, uh, pencil microphones, Neumann KM 184s. These are very good for acoustic instruments, and we're, today we're going to use them for over the top of our drum kit, primarily to pick up the cymbals. You notice we've got some other microphones too though. We have, or oh, first of all I'll talk about this one here. This is going to be our kick drum microphone. This is a dynamic microphone, not a condenser, it's a dynamic microphone. And we're going to put this in front of our kick drum and possibly our bass guitar amp when we're recording later on. Now we have some ribbon microphones too. Ribbon microphones are a bit different from condenser and dynamic microphones in that usually they're extremely fragile and you should never put 48 phantom volt, uh, 48 volt phantom power to them. If you do, and there's some incorrect wiring in your cables, you will actually bust them. Now the thing is about ribbon microphones, these tend to be very, very expensive. This one here is around about $2,000. This one over here, which is a stereo ribbon microphone, a bit over $4,000. So they are very, very expensive. However, the good news is, is that there are some companies bringing out some very, very low cost alternatives, which sound great. Um, Cascade is one company with their fat head ribbon microphones, which you can pick up for much less. Now, why use them? What's so special about them? Well, they give a very natural sound. They're very warm sounding, and they give, give a nice sort of uh, gentle, analogish, nice warm type sound. Often with a condenser microphone, the sound could be a bit harsh because it's picking up all that high frequency content so well. So if the cymbals that we record today, we find them too splashy, too zingy, too over the top, we can EQ it, or we can get rid of our condenser microphones and put in our ribbon microphone instead to pick it up with the sound of the drums. Uh, if we just flick around behind us, we're going to see that we've also got some condenser microphones here, and these are actually just set up to be recording all our room sound at the moment. When the band is here, you need to be able to hear some of what I'm hearing in the room, so I've got these set up to record the band. So let's plug them in. Let's start off with the lead vocals. We're going to take our condenser microphone and set this up. If I choose one of my Microphone cables, bring this over here. Now, I have got the fallback speaker set up in a very particular position for this microphone. This microphone has a hypercardioid pickup pattern. Actually, it doesn't. This one actually has a cardioid. <laughs> now that I look at the picture a little more closely. Now, what that means, cardioid means it's going to pick up the sound from in front of the microphone, such as where I am here, and it's going to reject any sound from behind. So any sound which comes up at it, it's going to not actually pick it up, it's going to reject it. Um, what we have, uh, what the good thing about that though, is that any sound from the speaker is not going to then come through the microphone. Uh, well, it's going to be minimised anyway, there will be a bit of leakage. And that's is us taking advantage of the directional capabilities of this particular microphone. So if we go and plug this in, plug this into number eight. Which brings me back to now that I'm setting this up, something which I've done earlier on that I should have introduced to you. And that is the use of track sheets. For those who are doing SOND 3, you'll see that you need some pre-production uh, uh, processes to go through. And I've set myself up a track sheet here showing where all of my instruments are going to be plugged in. The useful thing about this is it means that um, if I have someone assisting me, um, they can use this and they can put everything in the right position. If I forget where things are when I'm trying to track down a microphone cable which may not be working later on, I can look at my mixing desk. Having a track sheet written out beforehand is essential. It will actually make the process go much smoother and a lot better as well. 
This is one version which has come from an Excel spreadsheet which I link to in the Sonda 3 book. This is one you can purchase. And here's a free one I downloaded from the Mackie website. And this is actually the track sheet I've set up for our recording session that we're going to do later on. And we'll get to that. Um, but either way, essential. So with my track sheet in hand, I'm going to come over and plug everything else in. So we've got our condenser microphone here for the vocals, and that I plugged it into number eight. I might as well go backwards, and I'm going to look at the number seven, the guitar dynamic microphone. So for my guitar dynamic microphone, I'm going to use what is generally an industry standard. I'm going to use the Shure SM57. And I'm going to combine it, going through number six, with the Roya ribbon microphone, which is now also an industry standard. These two microphones together produce an amazing guitar sound. This one produces the warmth from the guitar amp. This one produces the bite, or the clarity. So we're going to set those up right over here. Now the Royal Ribbon microphone has got a special kind of shock mount that it's going to go on, so you've got to jam it in quite tight, and that keeps it nice and secure, so it's not going to move around. Now this amplifier we've got here is a Vox AC15, it has one cone in it, which makes it easy to record. Now we're going to put it around about the mid-range here, just tighten up my mic stand a little bit. And then I'm going to get another microphone stand and then put in my uh, other microphone, my Shure SM57, around about here. So let's go and do that now. All right, I've just gone and plugged in everything that we're going to need to use for miking up our uh, band today. Um, as discussed earlier, we have done a condenser microphone with a cardioid pickup pattern for our lead vocal. We've got our Royer ribbon microphone. Now, one thing I should also say is that the pickup pattern for this is not cardioid. It is actually figure eight, or bidirectional. So it's going to pick up that, but it's also going to pick up the side. So we need to be careful about that. With this microphone, we run, might run into some issues with the foldback speaker coming in too loudly into this. If that is the case, then we'll need to rely on our SM57 more for our front of house sound, which I'll go and plug in in a moment. If we come and look at the drums, we have, first of all, down the bottom, our kick drum microphone. Nice and close. Sometimes you might want to take the front head of the drum, of the kick drum off, and get this right inside so you can get a really nice, solid sound with lots of attack. Um, but, but the closer you go to the beta, the less low frequency information you're going to have as part of it. We have over on the snare drum, the Shure SM57 dynamic microphone, cardioid microphone. Excellent microphone for picking up snare drum. Uh, now, you might decide to have it a bit further away or a little bit closer up, depending on the kind of sound you're after, but that's going to be kind of okay. 45 degree angle, around about that, pointing at the centre of the snare. Over the top, we have our two overhead microphones, which are going to pick up the whole drum kit sound. Now, for this, I kind of want them sort of over the top of the snare drum, maybe it's a little bit back from that, and I've got what's known as an XY stereo setup. Now, two microphones, this one's picking up this side of the kit, this one's picking up this side of the kit. I had lots of choices of what to do with the microphone setup. We could have gone for a stereo pair with two microphone stands with one microphone pointing down sort of over here over the top of the cymbal or the hi-hat and the snare and another microphone over here. Now, what you've got to watch out is you might run into problems with phase if you do that. I'll discuss phase in a moment. Other options you could have is you could have one over the top of the snare drum and another one over the back of the, of the drum kit sort of pointing in. Now, um, this whole thing with phase, what I've done here with this is that the key thing to remember is that by having this kind of X, Y set up, I'm getting a stereo spread, but the sound from the snare drum, is that the sound from everything in fact, is arriving at both microphones at the same time. Why is that important, you're asking? Well, it's to do with this thing called phase. Basically, if microphone signals are out of phase with each other, then your sound will not be very good put it really uh, in very basic terms. You're going to lose parts of the fullness of the sound. Um, let me explain it to you with the old whiteboard. Follow me over here and we'll look at what we've got on the screen. Now for those of you doing SOND1 or SOND2, you may not be too up to waterless stuff to do with hertz and phase and everything else. As SOND3 people, if you've read your workbook that has been released with this video, you'll probably understand quite a bit about it because it talks about the theory of sound and you are required to know it as part of the unit standard. Anyway, let's back up a little bit. 
What I have here represented is one cycle of sound. Now, sound is vibration of ear molecules. Uh, as I talk, I, the ear molecules between me and the microphone which, you're, which is picking up my voice are going back and forth. I'm exciting them. They're going, they're squashing together and then they're pulling apart, squashing together, they're pulling apart, and it's a ripple effect. Just like when you throw a stone into a pond, you'll see the ripple effect. The, the water molecules don't actually travel from where the stone landed to the edge of the pool. They kind of stay where they are. They go up and down in a wave. And sound travels the same way. So the air molecules coming together could be thought of as positive. As they pull apart, could be thought of as negative. So what we have here is that this is a representation of one cycle or one part of the waveform, or one hertz. Now that, that term there, hertz, is important to remember because it's referring to frequency, which also relates to pitch, right? the notes that we hear, highs and lows. So 440 of those will give you an A um, above middle C on a piano, which is the note that a lot of people, uh, instruments, tune to. Um, so that gives you an A. 880 of these cycles, or 880 hertz per second, also gives you an A, but it is one octave up. 220 hertz, or 220 cycles per second, you've probably guessed it already, gives you an A, but it gives you an A an octave below the first 440. And so on, if I go down to 110, it's another octave down. 55, another octave down, and so on. Now, what's important to remember about how all this stuff works is that when you've got two microphones they are, that are picking up a sound, they are both picking up frequencies at different points. So this could be one of the overhead microphones, and I could draw another one to represent the other overhead microphone, which might end up looking like that. Now, you sum both of these waveforms from the two microphones together inside your mixing console or your recording system, and what happens is that parts of the positive energies cancel against some of the negative energies if they're like this, and it compromises the quality of your sound. So you might listen to each microphone individually, and they sound great, combine them together, the waveforms get combined, and they could end up out of phase. So parts of the one frequency is getting, uh, the, the boosts here could be getting cancelled by the negatives here, and vice versa, negatives here could be getting cancelled by the positives here, giving you a not very nice sound. Let's jump over to the computer and show you what that looks like inside a recording system. Okay, so as we can see here, I've brought up Pro Tools and I've put inside it a sine wave. Now this just sounds like this. Okay, not a very pleasant sound, but that is A440. Um, and that's what it looks like inside the recording system. We can see the waves. Now, what happens if I duplicate the signal, put it below, what will actually happen is it's actually just physically twice as loud. Now, Let's try and imagine that scenario where a sound uh, wave or a sound source is getting picked up by two different microphones that are not close together or not in phase with each other. And we can replicate that just by taking one of the sound waves off a little bit and see what it sounds like now. Okay, not too much different. Let's move it a bit further. Notice it's a bit quieter now. Let's move it a bit more. And it's even different again. Not only is it quieter, it's sounding a bit weird too. Let's move it off a little bit further. Okay, as we move forward again, it gets louder again. The other thing I'm trying to get at is very unpredictable. Now, let's look at what happens is if we take this bottom one and we invert it 180 degrees out of phase, or which would be known as flipping the polarity. Let me find my sound to do it, my invert plugin, and I render it. Now if you look closely, you know, if I try and actually make my tracks the same size, so they look a little more representative of each other, you'll see that the troughs of this waveform are now lined up with the peaks of this waveform and vice versa. The peaks here line up with the troughs. If I just solo this top track, so we're only going to listen to this top track, this is what it sounds like. Okay, no different. If I solo the bottom track, so I mute the top one and solo the bottom one, this is what it sounds like. Okay, no surprises so far. What happens if we listen to both of them at the sound same time? This is what we get. Complete silence. As you can see from the meters, sound is actually being produced. But because everything is 180 degrees out of phase, we're not hearing anything through our sound system. And so therefore, phase and being aware of it becomes a very important issue for us 
as we place our microphones. Okay, are you bored yet? Let's get into something practical. But those sound of three people, this kind of background is very, very important for you to know. So if we come back over to our microphones, we can see that because we've got them closely together, they're going to pick up all of the parts of the drum kit at the same time, so they're going to be pretty in phase, but because we've got this XY 90 degree angle thing going on, we still get the sense of the stereo spread. We still get the sense that the snare drum's going to be on that side and the low tom's going to be on that side. Now, what other situations do you need to be careful of? Well, if you're going to put two microphones in the kick drum, one inside the kick drum to get the attack of the beater, plus one further outside to get the sense of fullness. You could actually get phase issues there. If you've got multiple microphones on a guitar, you could have issues there. If you're using a DI box and a microphone on a bass amplifier, same sort of thing. So, yes, XY format is one way you can fix it here. The other thing to remember is the three to one rule. And what that means is that the distance between the microphones, if you're going for a spaced pair, I should say, the distance between the microphones must be three times the distance of what they are from the sound source. So if we had a microphone here around about one foot above the, um, about above the drum kit, we need to make sure that it's at least three feet away from the other microphone. So in placing them three times the distance apart to what they're going to be from the sound source or from the instrument. And that should reduce or minimise any phase issues. The last thing I'll quickly say about this though is that sometimes phase is good. I know I've completely contradicted myself, but having lots of microphones in a room, if they're placed in the right way, could actually mean that you get a nice sense of glue or a nice sense of togetherness in the sound. So sometimes phase actually can work to your advantage. So uh, with audio, the idea is that there are no hard and fast rules, there are guidelines. You follow the guidelines, if the guidelines don't quite work for you, feel free to break them. All right, so here we are, we need to plug in our bass guitar and we're gonna use a DI box for that. Here is a DI box here. Purpose of this is that we're gonna be able to take the guitar level signal, the bass guitar level signal, convert the impedance so you can plug it into a mixing console or a mixing desk. You can't plug guitars and bass guitars straight into mixing desks because what will happen is they'll sound flat and lifeless. It's not the right electrical impedance for them. So a DI box converts the impedance. It also makes it easier for us to send over a long, uh, long signal or a long chain. So our bass guitar, this is going to be our bass guitar cable here, normal guitar cable with a jack connector, just tighten it up. It's going to come to the input. Remember the signal flow from the bass guitar into our phantom power box, our DI box. Now, the DI box then comes out of here and we're going to use a female XLR connector, so a normal microphone cable, plug into the output. And then this is going to go around to plugging into our stage box, which is going to go for here on channel 5, as per my track sheet. Now, that means we've got the bass guitar signal going to the mixing desk. How do we get it so we get the bass guitar signal also coming into the amplifier so they can control themselves? Well, here we have another guitar cable, and in this case we use the through. This duplicates the bass guitar signal coming into our DI box. One signal, remember, is going out through the microphone cable, the XLR cable, to the mixing console. The other one, we can then duplicate it and send it through another guitar cable to the input of our amplifier, which I'll plug in down here. Now, DI boxes, most of the time, need phantom power. Um, some of them have batteries in, so you can put a nine volt battery in them, but most of them require phantom power. We do have some DI boxes which are passive DI boxes which don't require it, um, such as the radial JDI DI boxes, but we're not using those here. Most of the time, DI boxes require phantom power. Okay, here we are at the stage where we want to tune our room, we want to or tune our sound system for our room. We've gone and plugged in everything, There's all the microphones are set up, all the DI boxes are set up ready to go, all the speakers are plugged in, all the foldbacks are, speak, uh, are plugged in. What I want to do now, before I start sound checking the band, is I want to actually get my sound for my front of house speakers sounding as even as possible for this room. Now, every environment that you mix in will have certain frequencies that resonate more than others. And in some rooms that can be a big problem and make it harder for you when you're trying to do your equalisation of your instruments, trying to get them to sound good. So before we even start, we want to put a 31 band graphic equaliser across, across the system of the front of house speakers possibly the fallback speakers too. We're just going to do the front of house for now. Um, and we're going to try and tune the speakers for the room. 
We'll figure out which freq uh, frequencies in this room are overly resonant and uh, too predominant in the room, and we're going to flatten those out and try and make it really as even sound as possible. Now, as I discussed before, from this mixing console, we're going from the main outs towards our speakers. Often what you should do, if you've got an analog system, is that you should actually, between your uh, mixing desk and, and your speakers, you should insert a graphic equaliser, such as this one down here. Now, this has got, if you just bring the camera around to the front, we can just have a look here. This has got a 31-band graphic EQ, two channels, one for the left side, one for the right side. And you can use that to go and ring out all, any of the problems in your system to try and make the sound as even as possible. Now, I'm not going to use this one today because I've actually got a built-in one inside my mixing desk. And the great thing about by using our computer or using this digital mixing desk is that we can look at everything over here on a computer as well. Let's find our universal control, and we can see our graphic equalizers up here. OK. Pop right back, back around there. Thanks, Eddie. Now, how are we going to do this? The first thing we can do is that we can just run some uh, what's known as pink noise through the sound system. Now I've got some coming from my iPad, coming through there, and if you see over here on my iPad, we've actually got the, feed, the faders going up and down. Now, the idea of pink noise is it's noise which is the same, or white noise and pink noise, they're both uh, slightly different, but the general idea is that you're producing a sound which has an even amount of amplitude or volume at every frequency. And so if, therefore, our real-time analyzer, which I've got here in my iPad, is not showing up right, uh, then it means that there are some frequencies getting uh, emphasized by the room acoustics more than others. So using this, we can go and adjust our graphic EQ to, adjust, uh, to make it fix. Now, don't get confused with the, all of the, uh, the green bars on my computer screen because those are not representative of what I'm hearing out of the speakers at the moment. So what I'll be doing is looking at my iPad and bringing things down to match. In my iPad, I can set it around about 60 to 70 hertz is too predominant, so I'll go and pull these frequencies down to see if it's a bit more even. Yes, that's fixed it, that's good. And I can go through and do it that, uh, let's just reset this. I can go through and do it like that. That is one way of doing it. Now, the real-time analyzer on an iPad, as good as it is, is probably not the best one out there, because real-time analyzers used to cost over $1,000, in fact, they still do. So the fact that I've got one for $20, I think it was, um, for an iPad app, um, and it's, of course it's relying on the microphone on the iPad, it's probably not gonna be the most reliable um, way of figuring it out. But if that's all you've got, then it's a good start. What I like to do is I like to um, go and ring out the system using a normal microphone. We see over here, I've got a condenser microphone which I've got plugged into a channel on my desk, which is channel 16. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up this channel until it starts to feed back. And then I will be looking at my real-time analyzer on my computer and seeing which of the frequencies are those that are feeding back. So if I bring up my channel, let's listen to it. Bring it up very slowly. There we go. We can see that 320 hertz is the first problem that I've got. So I'll bring that down. Now what I'm going to be able to do is I'll now be able to turn up my gain on my mixer a little bit further, and then I'll find more frequencies will start to feed back, dependent upon the room's natural resonance. There we go. We can see we've got 800 hertz now. So I'll just pull that back a bit, and we keep going. 400 is also a problem, we pull it back. And we keep doing that for a couple of minutes until we've actually got a whole lot more gain in the system. By doing this, we're increasing our dynamic range. There's an important term for you to remember, you signed the three people, dynamic range. Difference between the loudest and the quietest parts uh, available in your system. By ringing out the resonant frequencies in the room, we're increasing our dynamic range, which means we can get more um, headroom into our system. So I can carry on and do that. Now, what I've done though already is I've already gone through, just like on a cooking show, I've already prepared one. On, because this is a digital mixing desk, I've saved it and I can just go and bring it in. So now my front of house sound is actually quite a bit different. And I can go and test it by playing a track um, just from iTunes for now. Let's go and listen to what it sounds like with the EQ off and the EQ on. So I'll turn the EQ off firstly, 
jump into iTunes, play a track. Okay, now to me straight off, remember that my graphic EQ is not turned on. It sounds a little bit too mid-rangey. It's not a very even sound. If I go and turn on my graphic EQ, which will now apply these settings, we can now hear it'll be a bit different. Now, I'm not so sure if that's coming through for you through our microphone so well, but the difference is quite um, a lot in here. We are hearing a lot less mid-range, it's a lot more of an even sound, which will therefore make my EQ decisions for my individual instruments later on, such as my vocals and my kick drum and my guitars, will make my decisions a lot easier to make. I can't emphasise the importance enough of tuning your room first for SON to three people, and also SON one and SON two if you're willing to give it a go. It will make your mixing job easier if you tune your room or tune your PA system for your room first of all. Now, because this is a special PreSonus digital mixing desk, I've got another little trick. Those of you that have this desk, I'll quickly show you something be called the Smart. What I'll do is I'm just going to go and reset that. What I have in this uh, is a new update for the system is they have the Smart software. And what this will do is this is going to send out some pink noise through our microphone over here, which is a special measurement microphone. If we just have a look at this, this is not a normal condenser microphone, this is a measurement microphone. It has an omnidirectional pickup pattern, so it picks up sound from 360 degrees around, not cardioid, not hypercardioid, not ribbon, not uh, figure eight, all that kind of stuff. And this is a special measurement microphone. This kind of exercise here won't work with a normal dynamic or condenser microphone. You do need a special measurement microphone. This particular one here is around about $150, which compared to most measurement mics, which are usually about 1000 at least, it's quite a good deal. So what this is going to do, oh, I've just gone up, set it. I just need to have it pointing at my left speaker. OK, so with the microphone pointing right at the speaker, we're going to be able to bring in the smart wizard that we have, which is connected to our mixing console. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to analyse our main left and right speakers. So we say, OK, we're going to do a basic analysis. OK, and I'm going to bring up this pink noise. Yeah. I can just mute that for now. Now, what's going to happen is that when I start the analysis of it going on, this pink noise will show the room response in a graph. Okay, so what we see here is we see this line which is representing the response that the microphone, the measurement microphone is picking up. And here are the bands of EQ that I've already gone and played around with. So I'll go and take each of those off and we can listen to the pink noise without the EQ applied. Now as I did each of those, hopefully you will have heard the pink noise change, the sound that we're hearing change. Now, the goal is, is to make this analysis line as flat as possible, hence I've gone and pulled these things down. However, I haven't gone and pulled down the low end too much because when I did it before and then played a music track through it, I lost all my bass guitar, I lost all my kick drum, didn't sound very nice. So I've gone and left that up with a bit of a peak down below, but down the bottom to give us a good solid low end. Now the idea is with that on, is that our, um, room is going to be much more tuned, our PA is going to be much more tuned for the room. So if I go and play us a track again and listen to this. Now that's sounding a lot more even. The only thing I would change from it though is I would go back into my, uh, my smart and I'm just going to go and change the bottom end of it. I've done two things here. I've given it a little bit more bottom end for the beef, and I've also gone to pull back a bit, of, a bit of the highs because when we're just listening to the vocals, then they're a little bit too sibilant, too much going on. So this analysis from the smart software is now applied to my EQ over my 31 band EQ, which is going out to my main speakers. So now everything's all set up. We're ready to bring the musicians in and to start sound checking. 
Okay, here we are. We've got the musicians here. They've arrived. We're going to start sound checking them to try and get our level set for the desk, trying to get it again in the optimum position for each channel. Now, if you're doing SOND1, this is perhaps a new thing to you, so perhaps you want to sit down with the mixing console and your teacher and look at what we mean by gain or trim, the input signal level. For level three people, uh, SOND3 people, you really need to make sure that you do this well to get the optimum signal path through your mixing desk. So I'm going to show you one method. There's another method which, um, if you look at this DVD here, which I encourage every teacher to purchase for their departments, Live Audio Basics, they show you another method for setting the gain up on a mixing desk. But I'm not going to use their method because I'm also using this for recording today as well as live sound. The benefits of a digital desk is I can actually record all of our channels onto the laptop too, and we can make a good rec multi-channel recording of it. So I'm going to set my gain level as I would on a normal recording system. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Harry to start playing the kick drum, and as he does that, I'm going to bring up the gain at the top until the meters are sort of about two-thirds of the way up. So a nice strong signal without it distorting. Thanks, Harry. Okay, good. Thanks, Harry. So I'm going to get him to play again in a moment, and this time I'm going to bring up the levels here as well so we can hear what's going on with the, with the bass drum in terms of the speakers and we're going to EQ it. There's some EQing that will need to happen to make sure it's a nice even sound. Thanks Harry. Okay, thanks Harry. Listen, let me quickly explain what I just did. When we first started, we heard a big boomy low sound happening, and so I got rid of some of that using a high pass filter. It's either a high pass or a low cut, it's the same thing. What it's done is it's cut off everything below 40 hertz. We then went to the EQ section over here, and I found that 155 hertz is also quite boomy, so I turned down some of that with a gain. I wanted a bit more click in the sound, a bit more of the attack, so I went to just under one kilohertz and boosted some of that. And then here, I found there was a bit of a boxy sound going on. So what I did is I turned the gain up and then I swept through the frequency range until it was at its worst. So I did, so let me just look for you looking at the computer, I'll show you what I did. I did pretty much that, it was sweeping through it until I found where it was at its worst sounding. Then I brought it back to around about there and put in a cut. So straight away what we've got now from our bass drum is a nice even sounding bass drum. Now let's move on and look at what the snare drum is going to sound like. Thanks Harry, snare drum. Things. So what you might have heard through the speakers was a really big kind of a horrible ring that was going on. So I once again I turned it up and I swept through until I found where the ring was and then took it out. Still a little bit of it there, so I need to do a little bit more, but a little bit more work. Harry, carry on, please. Okay, thanks Harry. Now, as you can see, I was having a bit of trouble finding exactly where that ring was. I found it around about 225 hertz, got rid of a whole lot more, but it's still a little bit of a problem there. So what I'm going to ask Harry to, to do is just to move his microphone just up a little bit from, this, from the snare drum. Just take it up Harry, just about an inch or so, a little bit further up. And what that will do, by changing the microphone, I'm altering the EQ. Now from what I can see, it looks like it's pointing a little too far away. So please keep it still pointing at the centre of the, of the snare drum but then just lift the microphone up so it's at a greater angle. Now let's just try that again. You're just going to play the snare drum again. Okay, thanks. And there we go. Straight away we can tell that that problem that we had before is gone by fixing it with the microphone. 
Okay, now I'm going to ask Carrie to play a bit of groove, a bit of beat, because now I'm going to set up the overhead microphones, which are picking up everything. So thanks, Harry. Go ahead. Now, even though I've done this quite a few times before, I still made the absolute noobish mistake. Can any of my students tell me what the mistake I made was? Why wasn't I hearing anything? No phantom power, that's right. So we've got condenser microphones over the top. So we have, and he's not even my student, that's good. So we'll just put in our 48 phantom power. So now when Harry plays again, we'll get the signal coming through nice and strong. Go, thanks. Alright, so what I was doing there is on my overhead microphones, channels 3 and 4, firstly I panned one of them to the left, I selected it, sent it off to the left speaker, selected the other one, sent it off to the right speaker. On both of them I then did duplicate settings, I did the high pass for both of them, got rid of all the low frequencies, anything below 320 hertz I cut out because we don't need it. All the stuff from the kick drum and the snare drum is um, coming from the other microphones, so we don't need that, we're mainly after cymbals at this stage. If we find the toms are a bit weak, then we might want to bring it back down a bit. Also did a bit of a shelf cut, and then also a bit of a shelf boost up high, once I turn that on, and this gives a little more sizzle to the, um, to the cymbals coming out. So, that's it, we've got our drums now, we're gonna go through the rest of the instruments and sound check them through the same method. We're gonna get them to play, adjust the input gain until they're nice and strong without clipping, and then I'm gonna go and do a basic EQ for each instrument. So, next time you see us, we'll have all the instruments ready to go.